The second part of my lecture will be devoted to the stage, sentimental drama. The same calming down process already described affected the stage. In 1698, theologian Jeremy Collier had published a pamphlet blaming restoration excesses. A short view of the immorality and profaneness of the English state. Yet public taste was already changing without the need for such pamphlets. Even Banbro's comedies tended to defend moral theses while narrating adulteries. And already with Irishman George Farquhar, for instance, in The Constant Couple, 1699, morality was on the path of restoration via the elimination not only of coarse language or scabrous situations, but also of moral ambiguity. Characters became divided into decidedly bad and decidedly good, the good ones being clearly victims. Soon emerged the sentimental comedy. No longer presenting London bows and bells, it focused on middle-class couples and their trials. Verse was dropped to the benefit of realistic prose dialogue, and pity replaced laughter, down to tearfulness. The classic example is Richard Steele's The Conscious Lovers, 1722. George Lillo devised the equivalent for tragedy and got not only public success but court patronage for what is very close to what we would call melodrama. His hit was The London Merchant, or the History of George Barnwell, 1731. Um, I'll give you the storyline. It's an apprentice seduced by a lady of pleasure who struggles to atone for this indiscretion. Going astray, Barnwell robs his master and murders his uncle to find money for the said seductress. Completely melodramatic. You might therefore say that by returning to morality, theatre, <clears throat> well, I'm afraid to say, entered a rather declining phase. Let us now turn to coffee houses. Uh, this is necessary to understand how prose really changed with the age of Pope. By the 1690s, London coffee houses had turned into hubs of political intrigue where men sharing the same views somehow congratulated each other, as usual, and exchanges and exchanged news and gossip reflecting the same views, again, as usual. Uh, the next step, today it's on the internet, you see people who think the same things tend to gather together. Uh, the next step was to spread such news and views in regular papers and magazines, not really to inform, but actually to try and influence society at large. This was the birth of early journalism. They also decided on creating more permanent and exclusive structures, the clubs. Paying members could have much more than the services of a tavern or coffee house not only reserved dining facilities, but everything from town accommodation to private gambling house. Uh, moreover, belonging to a club, being accepted by one's social peers, became an immediate badge of political allegiance and snobbery for, let's face it, wealthy upstarts. In fact, clubs could be many things, from innocuous jokes to drunkards' havens, to near secret societies. Again, I have give you, given you examples in the footnotes. In this new London club scene, the most famous Whig club was the Kit Kat Club, gathering men of letters like Congreve and Vanbrugh, he was a playwright but also an architect, painters like Nella, but also key politicians like John Churchill and Robert Walpole and also ambitious young men like Joseph Addison and Richard Steele. 
Before them, Daniel Defoe, whom we will mention below, had launched a magazine. It was the first magazine format. But Steele M. Addison really created the first influential titles with The Tatler and The Spectator, which they ran together until they fell out uh, in 1719. Aiming to, quote, enliven morality with wit and to temper wit with morality, they invented the leading article idea. In the shape of periodical essays, they wrote separately or together or sometimes inviting friends. In total, we have 271 for the Tatler. Some of them are indeed very innocent or sentimental pieces, but you find in some others real guidance, real political ideas. You have a fictional neutral editor signing the piece. Uh, for instance, you have Mr. Spectator. But this man is somehow telling you what you are supposed to think if you bought the magazine, which itself defines you socially. They were printed um, in limited fashion, 3,000 copies, but they were widely circulated, those magazines. And if the subscriber was a coffee house, for instance, all the patrons of the coffee house would read it. The rise in such publications led to growing demand for copy, i.e. contents. There had always been paid pamphleteers and writers since Tudor times, but the age of Pope saw the rise of whole, a whole industry of poor hacks concentrated in the St Giles area of London, where a street became synonymous with their bohemian poverty, Grub Street. A hack is an tachron, a sort of jack of all trades, a man who knows how to write and will write almost anything for money, any kind of copy, de quoi remplir les colonnes. So this was early journalism and periodicals, magazines. Simultaneously, there was, and perhaps more importantly for the future of literature, the rise of the novel. That's the most, um, perhaps the second most important point about this period. As we saw, poetry became highly codified and you might say artificial. The stage became tame, so real life had to find an outlet, and it was found in the novel. First and foremost, as what is still one of its basic definitions, fictional biographies. Other people's life stories one reads for pleasure, entertainment, but also moral comparison with one's own life. As mentioned in our first paragraphs, this corresponds to the rise of reasonableness, the middle classes, and the importance of the individual per se. A single life, even a common one, is worth something outside the collective, and even if it's not heroic, i.e. belonging to the best or worst categories of individuals, those worth memorising as models or anti-models. No. The first great novelist we must investigate is Daniel Defoe. A prolific polygraph, businessman and even spy, Defoe, in fact he was simply named Foe. But you see, he was already uh, using a nom de plume and trying to sound a bit more snobbish with Defoe. Um, he was born from a London middle-class family of Presbyterian dissenters. And like Pope, at the other end of the religious spectrum, he had been barred from attending university. But never mind. After some business ventures, lending him in debtor's prison, and pamphleteering, all the way to jail and the pillory in 1703, he ended up writing in favour of the Act of Union in 1707. And he even did, as I said, uh, he did some spying in Scotland with government pay. 
Fortunately, after 1719, he concentrated on writing, writing his great novels. To quote, but uh, the famous ones, uh, the most famous ones, Robinson Crusoe, 1719, A Journal of the Plague Year, 1722, and Mole Flanders, again, 1722. Building to some extent on the old uh, Spanish picaresque model and the taste for colorful adventures, uh, including fascinating tales of shipwrecks and piracy, not to mention danger, suspense, erotic thrill, etc. These books are masterpieces in their own right, with writing devices, um, for instance, first-person narrative with ellipses, bound to remain essential to the genre. Mole Flanders, the life story of a prostitute, is also an extraordinary social document, with moments of early realism. Near immediate international translations confirmed Defoe's relevance to his own times. The books became known throughout Europe. Um, maybe we could take a look at um, Mel Flanders, the opening chapter. Um, I'll just uh, read two paragraphs and uh, you'll see right from the start where Defoe is being totally original. There had been novels before. You remember those Elizabethan stories, again imitating the picaresque model, the Spanish model of low-life characters telling you about their stories, but never before had there been such realism. My true name is so well known in the records or register at Newgate and in the Old Bailey. Newgate was a famous prison in London and the Old Bailey still is the central criminal court in London. And there are some things of such consequence still depending there, relating to my particular conduct, that it is not be expected I should set my name or the account of my family to this work. Perhaps after my death it may be better known. At present it would not be proper, nor not that a general pardon should be issued, even without exceptions and reserve of persons or crimes. You see, even the language is rocky, with really syntax mistakes. Um, the writer is copying the very language that might be used by his Noel Flanders. It is enough to tell you that, as some of my worst comrades, who are out of the way of doing me harm, you see again that the level of language, out of the way of doing me harm, out of the way is... Bit slack, having gone out of the world by the steps and the string, as I often expected to go. Going out of the world by the steps and the strings, meaning, again this is bordering on slang, it means they were hanged, as I often expected to go, because she herself in the narrative uh, several times will be very close to execution. Knew me by the name of Mole Flanders, even the name Mole, you know, popular for Mary. And a mole very often described a low life girl, possibly indeed a prostitute. So you may have so you may give me leave to speak of myself under that name till I dare own who I have been as well as who I am. You'll read the rest. And the whole book will be just like that. It sounds realistic. It sounds like a real confession, first person confession of a person really talking to you directly with characteristics of language really corresponding to what she is supposed to be. She sounds like an old ex-prostitute telling you about her life. And when you read the book, of course, there are too many adventures too many twists and turns in the plot, but there is at least this early aspiration to realism, which was not there in uh, the Elizabethan so-called novels. The second most important novelist, let's use the term, of the period is Henry Fielding. He was a magistrate by profession after a life of ups and downs. Uh, among other things, as a playwright who ended up ruined. 
Uh, he certainly knew low-life characters and the twists and turns human paths can take. He's not a moralist at all, uh, except in reviling hypocrisy. He takes a satirical and amused view of the young men and women whose careers he narrates. In fact, his first novel was a parody of Richardson's Pamela, which we are going to mention. Uh, Fielding had actually written Shamela <laughs> because he was incensed at the author's tearful moralizing. His two great rollicking novels, often still hilarious today, are Joseph Andrews and Tom Jones. Uh, again, I have provided excerpt. I think one of my colleagues told me she would uh, she would do this one together with you in her today. Uh, it's a, a letter from uh, Joseph Andrews to his sister Pamela, and well, as you will see, it's really still today rather rather funny. Uh, 